<laughs> what does it say on the resume again? Yeah, it's, there are times not to do this. And it does make some sense to prepare some answers for various questions. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit when I come back to my favorite section of this talk, known as terrible interview questions and how to answer them. So have I put anyone else to sleep yet? Because I'm about to pass, up, pass out of here myself. So let's get serious about what we're actually here to discuss. It basically boils down to one thing and one thing only, and that is that I'm awesome. Yay. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm relatively well-spoken. I'm technically literate, and check it out. I wear a suit. <laughs> And I certainly don't have any self-confidence shortages. I may have the other side of that spectrum of problems, but that's a different story. This is a talk about selling yourself. That doesn't mean you need to turn into a self-aggrandizing jerk like I am, but it is imperative that when you're selling something that you believe in your product. And the secret is it's not just about me. It's that you're awesome too. Now, maybe you don't wear suits, even though you should, because they're awesome. But there are probably awesome things about you. If there aren't, we have bigger problems before we start tackling the job interview stuff. And your job, when you're interviewing, is to let what's awesome about you shine through. That's the entire point. It's not really a great idea to be overly modest in a job interview, because no one else is. And if you're modest and trying to share credit, that doesn't always go very well. Sometimes people are very proud to, to walk up and talk to me about interviews and say, well, I've never failed a job interview. Yeah, neither did I back when I was working menial labor jobs. Aim higher. If you're not striking out on interviews, you're not aiming high enough. I would urge you to keep going. There's no merit badge for never failed an interview. Keep pushing. It also turns into, a, this is also uncomfortable for a number of people who have different backgrounds. Sometimes it's cultural, cultural, sometimes it's societal, but it's not in everyone's nature to stand up there and tell you why they're awesome. This is one of those scenarios where even though it feels unnatural, it helps to overcome those tendencies. Be self-promoting in this context. So let's talk a little bit about what I, as the interviewer, want from you when I'm sitting down across the table from you. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions, but they're all me rephrasing three. It comes down to exactly three questions, and that's what every interview does. The first one is, can you do the job? The second one is, will you like doing the job? The third is whether or not we can stand working with you. <laughs> so let's go into those in a little bit more depth. When we talk about doing the job, this is usually where most of the technical questions tend to come from. And they take different forms. I might be awesome and ask you open-ended questions. Like, I log into a Linux box. How do I tell what distribution I'm on, or whether it's even Linux at all? The obvious answer to that is you name. But if you, even if you get that, I'm taking it away. Because there's not going to be a single right answer. There should be hundreds of right answers to a proper open-ended question. Turn into an open field, see how you think, and explore. Conversely, I could be really obnoxious with my interview questions and ask you what flag to DF is going to show inode usage. The correct answer, of course, is man DF, because who cares about flags in this context? Uh, bits and pieces of trivia aren't useful, and from my, my perspective, for properly assessing whether or not someone can do the job. It isn't also, as far as doing the job, depending on what the role is, it's not just about the hard technical questions. It's also about a social aspect, too. But we'll get to that in a minute. The second thing I'm generally looking to answer is, will you like doing the job? If you don't, you're probably going to quit in three to six months, and then we have to bring someone else in and retrain them, and it's awful. If we can figure out, wow, they're really going to hate the way that we do business here. That's a great time saver. And for example, if you're really passionate about one particular technology or two or three, and we don't use any of them here, you might not be particularly thrilled. For example, for me personally, I despise being on call. So if, and I'm very clear about that when I interview with companies, because I'm at a point in my career where I don't have to be on call. It's kind of nice. But if they're expecting someone to be on call uh, one week out of three, well, that's a good thing to know up front. And they're trying to figure out whether you're going to be OK with the way that they work. 
The last one is uh, a bit interesting. Can we stand working with you? And this takes a form, forms that are both subtle and overt. On the obvious side, don't be racist. I'm not kidding. That happened in an interview. I'll tell the story later. People care enough. Uh, on the, a more nuanced side, this gets back to the idea of passion around technology. Uh, for example, if I ask someone what their opinion is on salt stack versus chef, as far as configuration management systems go, uh, it's nice to see passion around that, but going too far to one side of that is just shows technical zealotry. And ultimately, no one wants to hire a zealot. Sure, you agree with the technology solutions we're using today, but in six months when we're switching something over that you don't agree with, how difficult are you going to be about that transition? Because some, some technologists can handle it, some can't. You, you want to show passion, but not a fanaticism. And this also comes down to the fact that, for better or worse, no one is going to sit down in a job interview across the table from you and say, OK, so let's put our cards on the table for a second. Are you an asshole? This is, this is obvious, given by the fact that I am employed. No one's ever asked me that. They probably should have. Could have saved everyone time. Additionally, if I'm interviewing you, and I'm terrible at it, because let's face it, a lot of people don't interview to hire people very often, help me fix it. If I ask you, so have you ever used Apache? The wrong answer is no. The right answer is no, but here's what I've done with Nginx. Because very rarely am I asking specifically, have you used this particular software at this particular version level to do this specific thing? I'm asking badly. To, for you to expound upon the entire area. Tell me what you've done with web servers, is what that question distills down to. So help steer it back to a productive discussion there. And there's a cultural element to this too. A lot of people don't want to overstep or correct the interviewer. And some interviewers don't want to be corrected, but you have to put your best foot forward. Be polite, be diplomatic, but don't just be giving yes or no answers. Very few answers should end with just a yes or a no in a proper interview. Don't overdo it, but it helps to control the conversation here. Something that I want to touch on again, I know I, I mentioned briefly earlier, is to be self-promotional. And a common approach for those of you who don't, aren't quite as narcissistic as I am is to attempt to share credit, which is a noble trait, and you are probably a better person than I am. Not that that's a particularly high bar for the pony to jump. but. When you say in an interview, my team deployed Nagios, what the interviewer often hears is, well, some people deployed Nagios, and I got to sit in the room while they did it. It's OK to share credit in that sense, but make very sure that you're talking about what your contribution to that project was. You want to highlight what, what you did and what you know and what you're able to bring forward in that. If you want to share credit, please do it. But uh, make sure you talk about your own contributions. Another thing that you'd be surprised how many people tend to mess up on is if I'm in an interview and I'm asking you a technical question, I probably know what the right answer is. And if you don't, making it up isn't likely to work in your favor. However, if you want to go in that direction, you can. But start with this. I don't know. But if I had to guess, at that point, speculate wildly. Either you're going to get it right and look, wow, they're really intuitive, or get it hilariously wrong. Well, they did say I didn't know. But either way, you're showing the interviewer how you think, which is really the bad thing that both people are looking to accomplish in the course of an interview. Now, I'd like to spend a few minutes going over some obnoxious interview questions that I've encountered over the uh, course of my career. I hate them all, and people keep asking them. So the point here is to prepare some answers. Because if you don't prepare answers, it's entirely likely that you're going to answer honestly, and no one wants that. So <laughs> why are you looking to leave your current job? Because of the darkness, it comes. <laughs> yeah. What's your greatest weakness? Raise your hand if you heard this one. Yeah. 
Well, in my case, some people tell me I'm condescending. That means I talk down to people. <laughs> Don't try that one. <laughs> this is an invitation for you to shoot yourself in the foot. Don't give in to it. Sometimes I have so much fun partying with my coworkers that I come into work the next day still drunk. <laughs> People sometimes phrase this as, if I called your old boss and asked him for a referral, what would he say about you? It's the same question. And the historical way that people have addressed this question has been to take a positive and dress it up as a negative. Well, you know, shucks, sometimes I'm just too much of a perfectionist. I don't quite know when to let a project go and move on to the next one. That has some downsides that are becoming increasingly apparent. That used to be a cliche answer, now it's a stupid one. What I've had great success and has never failed me is I will list an honest answer about a weakness that I have, but in the same breath, I will mention what I have done to correct it so it's not a problem. The one I've been using, and I'm giving it to you, free of charge, is I'm a disorganized person at times, so often I lose track of what it is I've committed to have done for various people. So as a result, I take a lot of notes and keep a lot of lists. The end. I've exposed a weakness, I've explained why it's not going to be a problem, and the worst possible interpretation is, well, I don't know, he's going to bring a notebook into meetings. <laughs> Another one is, can you give me an example of a time you had to blank or did blank? And you can fill in the blank. Had to work with a difficult person. Had to balance multiple competing priorities. Broke production. Punched an obnoxious, condescending interviewer right in his stupid <laughs> face. <laughs> You should have some stories ready to go for those common scenarios. Feel free to embellish them a bit to better address the point. I promise nobody's going to fact check you on this unless it is so far past the Looney Tunes realm that it just sounds ridiculous. <laughs> this is a question that I personally despise. It's called the read my mind and tell me what I'm thinking question. So I was interviewing for a startup a few years back and I was asked a puzzle, or a puzzle question about uh, some weird database interaction. They were writing their own database layer for replication and don't even ask, it was too stupid for words. But there was an esoteric edge case question. Okay, we were seeing slow queries on this side but not on the other side, what would cause that? And I said, okay. Well, at that, I went through a few basic troubleshooting steps and then I said, well, I'd probably break out strace. Really, what's strace? Well, it shows the system calls that a process is making as it winds up stepping through things. He's like, oh yeah, I guess that would show the problem. Okay, pretend that strace doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's one of those, I, I did something once that I'm really proud of and I want to see if you'll make the same steps that I did to solve it questions. I find that making a good attempt at these is basically all you can do, but when they reveal their cleverness, that took six weeks to resolve when two hours would have done it, uh, make sure you praise them well. Oh, that was a brilliant way. I certainly wouldn't have thought of doing it that way, only positively, <laughs> without the obvious sarcasm. <laughs> Why do you want to work here is another question you should have an answer to. I am deeply passionate about the business potential that your, clitter, your Twitter clone for pets represents. <laughs> Not a great answer, but you need to have something ready to go. And this is where you feign enthusiasm for whatever it is that they do. It also helps not to crap all over your previous employer. Um, so why are you looking to, so why'd you leave your last employer? Differences with my freaking boss. <laughs> that says a lot, none of it good. You left for growth growth opportunities. I reached a limit. Strategically, I want to do something a little bit different than I've been doing, and previous employer, Twitter for Pets, carried me as far as I can. Another reason not to say that you're looking to leave is because I'm broke. <laughs> so on a related note, let's talk a little bit about salary negotiation. This should not happen in an interview. The time to negotiate a salary is when you have an offer in hand. And the later in the process that offer comes in and the number is named, the better. Additionally, the first 
person to, lo to name a number loses. Do your best to ensure it's not you. You want to sell them on you. You don't want to sell them on a number. And you can always go lower from the first number that you name. You can never go higher. It doesn't work. Also, when they ask what you're making now, this is a part of the corporate job interview dance. It has become enshrined in corporate culture. It is the company's one free pass at screwing you. Don't give into it. Make up some weasel answers. Uh, for example, you can say, well, I'm not really comfortable talking about my current compensation because what I'm doing now versus what I'd be doing for you is significantly different. I'd rather talk now about what I can do for you rather than numbers. If they force you into a corner, because sometimes, admittedly, it happens, especially if you don't weasel your way into the interview, you sometimes are forced to give a number. At that point, what I like to do is take what I make now, pad it a little bit, add in the value of my vacation time, my sick time, my bonuses, my re uh, any retirement plan, and then maybe add 10%. <laughs> it's not a great approach, but it sometimes works. Also, when it comes down to knowing what you're worth, it helps to go in armed with numbers, just in case you get, you get cornered into knowing what your market worth is. And like the funny comment says, the comic says here, if what you believe you're worth and what the market believe you're worth differ, always assume that you're wrong. Personally, I think the value of what I do is about six bucks an hour. The market disagrees. So I'm not quite stupid enough to argue the point. To do this, I find things like Glassdoor.com, Salary.com, and other similar sites to figure out what is normal, both at the company you're applying to, as well as what market average is for your, uh, for your skill set. Additionally, knowing realistically where you compare to the market is valuable. Um, the ultimate idea here is you want to go away from being a commodity, which we all are at the beginning of our career, and into being the talent as quickly as we can. So at that point, well, then obviously I'm above market average in terms of salary because I'm above market average in terms of performance. I might not phrase it that way in an interview, but it's worth uh, bearing in mind. A lot of companies tend to forget this one, too. Um, it was great. I was at Scale, a conference beginning of the year, and a company that I was speaking to about potentially have maybe coming aboard wound up have sending a recruiter there. And I said, oh, terrific, great. Where are the rest of your engineering staff? I was looking forward to seeing a few of those guys. Well, we have a big release coming up, so they're working all weekend. This is a warning sign. Wow, I, I kind of like going to the biggest conference in the area that comes once a year, but instead they're all working on a massive release. I'm not a big fan of 14-hour days. So this tells me that if I want to keep a decent work-life balance for me, this might not be a great company to work for. Other people might look at me like I'm crazy. Well, they want to get very invested in what they do, and they want to build something from scratch. Terrific. People want different things. Surprise. And remember as well that uh, even if a company offers you a job, you certainly don't have to take it. Ultimately, this all comes down to preparation and practice and practice and practice. And to that end, what I recommend doing is doing what I like to call practice interviews. Once a quarter or twice a year, whatever makes sense for you, go out and sit through a job interview. In all likelihood, you won't wind up leaving where you are, but it gives you practice and gives you a chance to sharpen the saw. The worst case scenario for you in doing this is, well, crap, I like where I am, but they gave me a job offer that's really hard to turn down. It's a good problem to have. Someone also once asked me about the ethics of that. Is it ethical to take a practice interview when you don't intend to accept an offer? It's a good question, but my current job was a practice interview, and I've been there for a year and a half. I've still gone on practice interviews since, but I'm happy where I am. I'm not particularly interested in leaving. But if someone may wants to make an offer that is compelling, and I'm not just talking money, I'm talking about career growth and advancement, then potentially I would be willing to talk. Unfortunately, especially in the Bay Area, 
Some people haven't quite grasped, but for me, offering me piles of equity on uh, stock options in your three-person startup that hasn't yet raised Series A isn't the most compelling thing from my perspective. Your mileage may vary. This is the last question that they will ask you in an interview. And the reason it's the last question is because you are going to start peppering them with questions and you're not going to let up until they surrender and call it, well, we're out of time, have a great day, please stop asking questions. Uh, my, one of my personal favorites when I can't think of anything that usually gets the ball rolling is, look, you've spent a lot of time looking for the proper people for this role. You still have, you've spoken to a number of candidates and obviously you haven't filled this yet. So if you don't mind my asking, what is it you're looking to see in the successful candidate that you haven't found yet? It's a nice way of asking, so what is it you're actually looking for in this job? And then you listen and they'll tell you. In many cases, they'll also tell you where, you're, where things that you can reinforce. Well, we don't really want someone who's going to put on a suit and go talk at, uh, about stories from the interviews here. At which point you assure them that that is something you would never do because good lord, it doesn't work for me. It certainly won't work for other people. But it's a way of reassuring any last minute doubts that they might have. One other thing I'm willing to do, because this always goes well, is people are scared to start applying for other jobs for those practice interviews. So you have my email address on the board. Send me a copy of your resume. We've got a fun phone-based technical interview process. I am thrilled to put people through it and see what it is, where you're strong, where you're weak. It gives you a good barometer of where your skills stand, and it helps build momentum. It breaks you out of the inertia of sitting in a job, not applying for new jobs sometimes. Some people like it, some people don't, but I think that movement is imperative as far as career growth goes. Honest, worst case, you get an assessment of where your skills are in the market in tech today. Uh, best case, you get a job offer and come work with me and get to make fun of my suit like everybody else. <laughs> and interviewing is a skill. Practice it. Now, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> there we go. Someone was listening. What have you got? What do you suggest for people who may not have super strong tech skills so far? Mm -hmm. Some of these more technically based interviews. Yes. Like a way to Sort of. Um, generally, when people say, well, my, my, my skill set isn't strong enough to pass a technical interview, it, it speaks to one of two things. Either they're used to some of the horrific Google-style interviews where they're going to drill and drill and drill until you wind up weeping and leaving the interview room. It, it didn't go well the two, two times I've tried that. <laughs> but, it, but that's generally not a common case. Adi alternately, it's often people who are transitioning into the field from another career path. And there are what I like to call bridge roles, where you wind up taking the skills that you've developed on an alternate track and applying them forward. You might not start off in one of those roles with a strong technical basis, but it's a, it's a way of transitioning in and picking up those skills while still leveraging what you used to do. When you do a career change, almost never is it a, well, I've been doing this for 10 years, now I'm going to pretend none of that existed and go for entry-level roles in this other field. Find a way to transition over a period of a year or two. It's a much better approach. Great question, though. Anyone else have anything to ask? Do you have a like bilingual? Oh, uh -huh, I'm sorry. Bilingual. Uh -huh, one more time. Bilingual. bilingual. The two oh. languages or three languages, four language people capacity wise. Not just no code of a language like a language like Japanese or English, French, Spanish, whatever. Do you do that language also for the interview, or just on English? That's going to depend entirely on who is uh, who is doing the interview and what the role looks like. Okay. Uh, for small companies, for example, there may very well not be someone who is mm -hmm. fluent in a second language. Mm -hmm. At larger companies, especially with ones with a multinational presence, yeah. they're going to be uh, used to accommodating that sort of thing as a matter of course. Uh, it's a it's just a question of it depends on the role and the specifics of the person and what the expectations around the job are. Okay. Good question, though. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, remember that by the time it comes, so the question is, is you wind up getting a job offer or what I term an exploding offer where it's all right, we've gone through three rounds of interviews. We've been speaking to you for a couple of weeks. We've gone through a whole process. We offer you a job and we'd like you to get back to us in 10 minutes with whether or not you accept. 
Well, that doesn't work, uh, especially if you're talking to multiple companies. And I'm very open about that. I appreciate your. I appreciate you want to move quickly. I know you're excited about me. I'm excited about you too. But I am midway through the process with a couple of other companies. I'm going to need a few days to sit down, think through my options, talk it over with people whose counsel I value, and go from there. Remember that you can tell a lot about a company by how they buy their people. And if they do that with high pressure, decide now or you're out uh, discussions, that tells you a lot. It depends on the specifics of your situation, of course. I mean, for, and same here. If I were unemployed and hadn't had an offer in three months, I'd probably take it because it beats starving to death. If I have other options and I'm not in a particular hurry, that rubs me the wrong way. And OK, I see what's going on here. This is, this is a high pressure scenario trying to convince me not to look at this too closely. In fact, I'll take extra time and think about that because that tells me there's something I'm not seeing. They push hard enough, I'll walk. So what, yes, Does that answer your question? Perfect, thanks. Sorry. So, so what do you feel like is the acceptable window for an offer to be open? Because obviously on one hand it seems like a long window for open. Like I give you an offer on Monday and you have two weeks to reply. That yes. seems like that's maybe worse for the company because they yes. could be using it to shop around, but better for the interviewee, right? The shortest I would ever turn around on someone, and I'm talking about pie in the sky, no negotiation necessary, is your is I would probably want to sleep on it for the night. But you get what I mean is like yes. as an employer, you're trying to hire. You say you have 48 hours to respond. I mean, what, I, what is the reasonable window there? The reasonable window. The, the way I've seen companies handle this well is they will wind up. They will say we'd like to, we're making we're extending you an offer. We're getting it to you in writing later today. When can you let us know by? And then they put it back on the candidate, which is reasonable because that sets the expectation. If the candidate says, well, I'll let you know within six months, really? <laughs> Conversely, if they say, actually, I'll sign it right now. Do you want me to sign it right now? Well, to be honest, I'd kind of like to rethink giving it to you. Because no one sane is going to sign a contract they haven't read, and we don't hire crazy. Um, also, when I'm pushed into a corner, something I wanted to point out as well is, well, what would it take? Well, we need a number before we proceed. What will it take to make you work here? Pick something that they would be idiots to take. And conversely, when they make you an offer, whenever that offer comes in, your trick is to look at it. I don't care if it's 500 grand a year and a company helicopter. Your job is to look at that and say, hmm, and then count to 10. And then look up and look very conflicted and say, is this the best you can do? And then shut up because the next person who speaks loses. Don't be that person. You think I'm kidding. It sounds crazy, but it works. Like, because often they'll come up with something great. I'm like, well, we can't really go any higher in the salary, but we could throw in another week of vacation. By counting to 10, you just got an extra week's pay out of your employer. It doesn't hurt. Once they've made the offer, they are almost never going to rescind it because you've bothered to negotiate it politely and in good faith. If they do, congratulations, you dodged a bullet because they're not looking for someone who's going to stand up for themselves at all. And Frank, that sounds like a miserable working environment. Yes? So, okay, so you, you, you count to 10, you look at you and say, can you do better? And they're like, mm -hmm. what then? What, what next? I mean, you, Ultimately, you they're going to go to a, either initially or after a little bit of back and forth, they're going to get to a point where they are about at their highest offer. You can, you can explore things like extra vacation time, telecommuting once a week, whatever it is that uh, moves you. But ultimately, they're going to reach a point where that's as high as they'll go. At that point, you never give an answer on the spot. You always want to sleep on it. And that, at that point, the games are more or less over, and you have to figure out whether that offer is compelling enough for you to go work there or keep looking or stay where you are. If you have the name the first counter offer because you've been backed into the corner, mm -hmm. what would you, do you have any guidelines about that? So they offer you 50 grand a year or something, you say take 10% of that and say 55 or you know really go for growth, 75. You know, if they start with 50, how would I counter that for yeah. something higher? Um, in this hypothetical, what would I actually be wanting? I mean, obviously more is better, but what is my reasonable expectation there? Because if, if they offer me 50, it's like, well, that won't do it, but I will do it for 120. At that point, I'll be laughed out of the room. Right, right. <laughs> but, there, but if I say, well, 
I was hoping for something closer to 70. Could we negotiate in the meet in the middle and save some time at 60? At that point, if they talk you down to 55, congratulations. You talked it up five from where it was. It, there's, a, there's a lot written on the art of how to negotiate a salary, and that tends to go almost into a talk all on its own. Yeah. But it's, and it's, the problem is it's really situation, situationally dependent in many cases. Culturally, culturally sensitive as well. Absolutely. And one of the biggest interesting things in America today is that there's this great taboo around anyone discussing compensation whatsoever. And this tends not to help employees. That's why things like Glassdoor.com are so valuable. Because you want to know what people in your space make, but going to your turn your coworker and saying, "Well, I make seventy grand. What are they paying you? Eighty-five? But you're drunk half the time." <laughs> yeah. It doesn't go well. By having that that personal uh, attachment to that it tends to break and fracture social norms. But being able to get a bigger picture view of that can be extremely handy. I prefer to go in armed with more data, not less. Yes. I had a situation in a technical interview where. I question was asked that I felt was designed deliberately to frustrate and annoy me. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't there was an answer, but the answer was completely uh, unexpected and far beyond the typical uh, line of duty for the, for mm -hmm. the work involved. And um, so the interviewer continued to, to badger me and place roadblocks in my way to prevent an answer from coming up. In, in those situations, which I feel are designed to, to present some kind of emotional test, it is. Uh, is the best. What, what's the best course of action? Just the calmest all voice in the room wins in those scenarios. You want it to be you. Uh, you put on the good. You put on a good try. You smile like, huh? That, that's a little frustrating. Even admit to it. Like that's a little frustrating. Let's see how else we could attack that. As long as you continue to make forward progress and continue to. Uh, explore where it goes. A lot of times they will ask questions that are, that are way out there that they don't expect anyone to get to. It's a question of what do you do? Do you give up? Do you get angry? Do you wind up punching the interviewer in their stupid condescending face? It's, it's a valid interview technique, but I admit it's extremely frustrating when you're in the moment there. And it's not something I happen to handle particularly well personally either. It took me years to get to a point where I managed to repress all visible signs of irritation and just put it on in good faith. Also, sometimes it's just the interviewer across the table is crap. And sometimes you can't get away from that, for better or worse. Yes? So the other half of the purpose of interviewing is to find out like what the team culture is going to be like, whether you're going to actually want to be there. Yes. Um, are there any particular like tells or particular questions that you like to ask to really gauge whether the other people on the team you're interviewing with actually like it there? Of course. In fact, something I'll do is every time I meet with someone, again, what I'm looking for is probably going to be very different than what you're looking for or anyone else is looking for. We all have our own impressions of what kind of culture we'd like to work in. For example, I wear a suit for God's sake. Most people would find this abhorrent. I'm actually the only consultant that does at Taos, which is the funny part, but <laughs> I have problems. Yes, but something I like to ask, especially when you have a series of five people coming in to speak with you throughout the day, is do you have any questions for me? Yes. What's your favorite part about working here? And they'll give you a fluff answer. The soda's free. We have a great sense of community. We have a great sense of teamwork. Whatever. Continue to let them run their jaws. And then say, great, that's very useful. Now, not to put too much of a negative spin on this, but what is your least favorite part about working here? And then listen. And the, the individual responses don't matter so much as the overall trend. If everyone says, well, there are some management challenges here. That's a warning sign. You're an outsider. They're admitting this to you. Look twice. And you're always going to encounter people who are more gregarious than others. Well, it's interesting you said that. You're not the only person I've heard that from outside the company. Could you be a little bit more specific? What type of management challenges? Well, let me tell you the story about the CFO. And then you're in gold. <laughs> It, it tends not to, but usually when people start dancing around that, uh, safe answers are generally all over the map. Someone complains that the sodas are cost 25 cents in the break room and they used to be free. Other people complain that, well, they're not as big on working from home as I would like. I asked that at a company I started. I went around the room in an open room interview and asked everyone that question. And someone said, well, my job was described to me as being uh, doing working on one thing. 
then someone else left and I had to step up to fill their shoes and I'm doing it, but what I'm doing right now isn't what I want to be doing, which I thought was a very fair and honest answer and didn't betray anything particularly negative about the company, but I appreciated the honesty that it took to answer that. So little things like that. Um, the hard part as well as an interviewer is when, so why do you want to work here? And someone comes back with, uh, I want to work at a company that believes in its people and strives to make them better than they already are and provide a great working environment. The hard part is not busting out with, so do I, damn it, so do I. And it, yeah. it helps to have a good employer to represent when you're doing these things. But yeah, it's, interviewing is an, interesting, is an interesting time. It's one of the few times people talk in depth about work in a sense of what else is on the market. So as an interviewer, one of the most frequently questions I get asked mm -hmm. again, you know, they're trying to ask questions, is tell me about an average day at work for you. And I mm -hmm. find that to be a really hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. Because there I are no average days? Or because uh, what you're doing is different than what they would be doing? I think it's because I look back at the last two years of work, and it's hard for me to average out 600 days in, mm -hmm. in my head in 30 seconds. Uh, so what should I imagine they just asked me? What are they really... You know, what, what exactly? They're trying to get a broad overview sense, uh, in my, I would guess, of what the, what the work actually looks like. For example, I worked at a company for six weeks, that's your first warning sign, where the average day was this. We would show up at 9 o'clock. At 9.45, we had a 15-minute stand-up meeting. At 10.30, we had another meeting where we sat around and talked about stuff. We then worked for 45 minutes and had another meeting that sometimes went an hour and a half. Then it was lunchtime. Then we did some work, and then we had two more meetings uh, that were breaks by five minutes between them, and then a two-hour span, and then we went home. Wow. How do you do any work? Yeah, yeah that, and that, that was a great, uh, if I had asked that question, so describe a typical day and the workflow looks like, and someone told me that. No further questions. Thank you for your time. Have a great one. But I think that's what people are trying to get at. It's not the most effective way of ferreting out things like that. But people are looking on the whole, what does it look like? Will I spend most of my time firefighting? Will I spend most of my time working on projects? What's the breakdown? How is the corporate culture around meetings? Um, and what do you say about a typical day? Well, at 3 o'clock, we all knock off for beers, says something. Maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. Who you are is probably going to determine whether that answer is good or bad. But it's a, it's a valuable data point. Additionally, remember that not everyone who asks that question is coming at it from the same place. Some people might be more interested in one aspect of that. Some people might be more interested in another. Does that help at all? Yeah. Okay. Just had a question at the very beginning when you talked about you know, LinkedIn for, for getting, getting to that interview part and what you talked to. Mm -hmm. Are uh, meetups or, or conferences like that, are those good tools to use to make that happen? <coughs> Do you think I'm here to show off my new suit? Absolutely <laughs> it is. It's, uh, yeah, part of the reason that I go to these things is I meet people who are doing interesting things. And except for this one, I don't usually go to many talks at conferences. The reason being is I find the hallway track is more valuable because I get to meet people I may not have spoken with before, talk with them about what they're working on, I talk about what I'm working on and problems I'm encountering that I'm butting my head against. And then someone just comes out of nowhere and says, oh, yeah, I dealt with that six months ago. Here's how I solved it. Well, crap, you just saved me six weeks of work. Thanks. And it turns into an ongoing dialogue. You get to meet people. Sometimes if you're active on IRC like I am, you get to put faces to names of people that you've been speaking to, sometimes for years, but never met before. Any chance you get to go out and get exposure to the broader community pays a host of benefits. Uh, there's a certain stereotype in our field of people who never leave the basement and are always staring at the computer. There's a subset of the culture that's like that, I will agree, but it's far from the norm. And it's certainly no longer what the type of person you're going to find doing this professionally. Because businesses don't want to hire people without social skills. We all have too many meetings for that. The days of the dot-com bubble were great. Okay, so on the plus side, you don't cold fusion. On the downside, you refuse to wear pants. But you don't cold fusion. So will you take a quarter million dollars, sit in the cubicle over there, and we'll throw Cokes over the wall to you every six hours. Those days are gone, and I don't think they're coming back. You can be eccentric enough, but not too far to it these days. Yes? So that, that must be a new suit. It looks very nice. It, it flat, it's hey. very flattering cut. Awesome. That's the big secret to suits, since you asked. You did, but I'm pretending you did. <laughs> the material is, is nice and all, but the number one thing that makes a suit look good or bad is the fit. Get it custom tailored, for oh, God's sake. 
Absolutely. And uh, speaking yes. of flattering, is it appropriate to flatter your enemy? <laughs> <laughs> It depends on how transparent you're being. But ultimately, people, it's a fair question. And I tend to do it at a low level, but you want to leave them with the impression that you respect their technical prowess on some level, because people are ultimately making an emotional decision. And the perspective on you as a candidate is going to have emotional overtones of, did I enjoy talking to this person? If you're sitting in an interview and every, as I'm an interviewer, and every third word out of someone who I'm interviewing's response when I give them an answer that they ask for is, well, actually, forget it. At that point, it's, well, he, he's uh, awfully critical and corrects me every time he thinks I've gotten something wrong. Some of the time he was even right, but that doesn't help. It's one of those, you want to get along with the interviewer. Is it right? Maybe not, but it's definitely a truism in the way that things work today. Speaking of dress, then yes. exactly how important is it to show up to an interview dressed nice? That's a great question. Um, believe it or not, I am the only person I know who dresses down for an interview. Um, in technology, for almost every role except the, oh, head wound uh, job at Oracle, this would be showing up as co completely overdressed, and it would diminish any technical credibility I had going in the door. So when I dress, when I go into an interview these days, I generally find that a, uh, that a dress shirt, a, set of, a pair of pants that are not jeans, and uh, I did, sneakers could be okay, but usually black dress shoes is the way to go there, uh, at least for men, tends to be an appropriate way to go. As far as women go, don't even get me started on that. I have absolutely no idea what women's fashion <laughs> does. I, sorry. So something like this level of dress? Uh, I would tuck in the shirt, probably, and maybe consider something long sleeve. But other than that, you're fine. The hat, you might want to leave in the car, depending on that. But that's a personal choice. It could be your rent. I would give you bonus points for that. Right, exactly. And the guy at Oracle is going to have a problem with it. So it really all depends. Really where you want to work, though, too. People like that. If you want to work, you have to incorporate Right? Right? <laughs> so, a question about compensation at startups. Yes. Right? Very early stage startups advertise, oh, we're giving you ownership, and what's your, any general feelings on that, or how it comes into the conversation? <laughs> the best description I heard of this is, okay, here's how you value an equity grant. Roll a D100. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, if you're a different kind of geek, Rand 100. <laughs> 1 to 70, you get nothing. Sorry, zero to 70, you get nothing. 70 to 90, you wind up getting a amount of money that's roughly equal to the amount of salary you'd have taken at a big company, so it balances out. Um, probably 90, let's say 95 to uh, 99, you struck it big, and you're very well off. You have a life-changing amount of money. You're not the richest person you know because everyone you've been working with got in before you did and wound up making more out of that. And out of 100, congratulations, you struck it big. You are rich beyond the wildest dreams of avarice. The perceptive people here realize that a RAND 100 and a D100 do not have 100 as an option. It doesn't really happen, and here's why. Um, there are rare exceptions to this. But those are those, remember we're looking at survivorship bias here? We only need to think about the ones that succeeded, the ones that failed, we've never heard of. Additionally, remember how much, um, knowing how much your grant is up front, you have no idea how many rounds of funding it's going to take, whether the company will survive, how much dilution is going to impact you. And remember that there are people whose entire purpose in life is to negotiate deals. They know more about deals than anyone in here does about technology which is saying something. And then think about what you could do to a program or a system if several hundred million dollars were on the line. And you've got an idea for exactly how adept they are at screwing other people out of equity. It's a bit of a rigged game from my perspective. That said, I've gone through the startup game a couple of times. It didn't pan out. I tend to personally list heavily toward, uh, a sal toward salary instead because then I can do my own investments and gamble on my own time. Uh, that said, other people feel differently. I have a very good friend who only wants to work at startups, 
and I sat down and went through the same spiel I just inflicted on the rest of you and said, so explain it to me, Kevin. Why do you want to work at startups? You're smarter than this. He's like, oh, I know I'm never going to strike it rich doing this, but I like the culture. I like being able to have the entire company sitting around one pizza and ask questions about how something is the way it is and being able to change it. And that's a very fair answer. And I suppose there is a chance. Of course, there's always the chance, and it's enough to keep things interesting. You're right. But personally, also, as I mentioned, I'm a consultant. I've been at uh, a Taos now for 18 months, which in real people job terms is equivalent to being somewhere for eight years. A four-year vesting period for me personally probably isn't going to happen. I'm an asshole. We covered this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm difficult to put up with after one year, let alone the rest. I mean, frankly, I've been talking now for almost 50 minutes. You're probably all sick of me. So it, again, this wears thin really quickly. We should wrap it up, by the way, so the next oh. speaker can Of course. <laughs> we'll take one more question, and then we'll call it a day. So uh, how, do you, how are your thoughts on publicly traded stock compared to I generally equity? tend not to like the enormously uh, large public companies that, uh, again, if that's a, the work environment that works for you, terrific. And if that's usually much easier to calculate out, well, I know exactly what a share of stock is worth today and how much of it they're giving me. That's a much easier calculation to do on the back of a napkin and figure out to, with a relatively high degree of certainty uh, what that's worth in today's dollars. Now, the company can succeed and the company can fall, but you don't usually see public companies trading at a thousand times their value in, in two years. So it really tends to depend. Okay. Thank you all for taking the time listening to me.